Okay, I'm actually gonna do this. With the first half of 2.1 coming to a close really soon, with Kokomi just around the corner, I've decided to address something that's been on my mind ever since I played through the main story of Inazuma. Especially in 2.1. The story has potential that it didn't utilize. In a, vi in a video made by Chill with Aster about 2.1 story, they outline several points, the general feeling that the story is extremely rushed, where plot lines don't have a nice resolution and things just get, like, fixed because of Yaimiko and her connection with A. This is obviously spoilers for the 2.1 story, so if you haven't played it, play it yourself. I really, really urge you to play it yourself, because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. To quickly summarize some points with Inazuma 2.1, I have a, a small list. Uh, most of these are points that Aster has talked about, though I've added my own. The Vision Hunt Decree abolishes too quickly. Oh, I'm not going to go into depth with these points. I, I have other things. The Vision Hunt Decree abolishes too quickly. Tepe's questionable amount of screen time. And the delusion plot point. It, again, it's general feeling of being rushed. The lack of impact, haha, <laughs> funny joke, of the resistance movement led by Kokomi. And speaking of Kokomi, she was not that present in the story. Neither Beido, Goro, Kazuha, or Sara really had the screen time that they needed, though. Sara arguably had almost enough. The fact that Yaimiko just shows up and fixes everything is annoying. With the very little with the the outcome of the conversation with A having very little consequences for the actions taken by the Tri Commission. The feeling of a not abolishing the Vision Hunt Decree despite knowing about Fatui, about the Fatui meddling of it. Sure, she might not have known about how it's affecting her people, but it's the Fatui. So that can, that's one of the less annoying or wasted points there. I feel Aster felt that the delusion plot point in Inazuma, the fact that the, the fact that the factory is there and the fact that it is manufactured using crystal marrow, she felt that these had to be shown and I agree, they had to be shown at one point because it's the main weapon of the antagonists. And it kills people. I agree they had to be shown, but they needed more time. They needed more places to be impactful. Having a single factory in Inazuma is smart because it's right next to the materials you need. 
but having a single point of failure for something as important as the main antagonist weapon of choice is stupid from a strategical standpoint much like much like what happened someone could just burst in and not act like us instead just set off explosives and destroy the place so that's another thing that needs to be addressed what will the Fatui do now that the factory is destroyed sure they still have their delusions that they've already manufactured but eventually they're gonna need more The exchange of the Gnosis being shown off screen, or not shown at all. It happened off screen while we were passed out. The general lack of screen time of Scaramouche. Keep in mind that for players that are just starting the game right now, that did not play the Shooting Stars event, what is it, almost a year ago now? This is the first time we meet Scaramouche for them. So he has to be more impactful. Signora, as despicable as she is, we've, we've, um, we've seen Signora work. I have no gripes with her being the boss fight that we get during this update. But we also needed time for Scaramouche. So, and in general, the Harbingers just felt like a minor threat. With, with how the story unfolded, it put way, way, way more focus into the resistance movement, the people fighting against the Shogun's army, only for it to be sidelined and go, hey, let's look... Let's look at the Fatui! Ooh, the Harbingers are here! Woo. I know this is a personal thing that is that should probably be left in the story quest instead, but Yai just kind of says that a has changed a lot or has become a lot more stubborn. I feel like I feel like by using elements outside of the game, like the trailers that showed off Ace Friends, we could have more depth to both of these characters that a majority of the Genshin Impact player base will not have now. Like I know some people that don't watch the trailers that choose to be spoiler free and just see, oh, this is that character. Oh, that's where they come into the story. They don't know any, they would rather choose to be blind to every character, their abilities, their element, their whatever they, whatever, whatever have you. They enjoy that feeling of shock but in doing so they lack the context of the trailers and it makes the characters lose a bit more depth because very few people except for those that decide to make content about it there are only a few people that choose to read the storyline the the voice lines and as much as I love the voice actors, it, it's kind of out of the way and uh, underappreciated because the stories of these characters are so in-depth, they're so deep, and it's just wasted if it's not, you know, shown. We've known... Take... Take the Li the Liwe arc, the Liwe arc, for example. We know that Zhongli created Guyun Stone Forest during the war to seal off what was his name? The water the water hydra thing that made it rain really bad. 
that was the cause of their fight. You could argue that Yashiori Island is the same for Inazuma, because that's the fight between the Shogun and the giant snake. But we don't see the giant snake! We fight the giant water thing that Zhongli sh sealed away. We don't fight the snake because it's already gone. Thus, the whole backstory of that has much less, much less, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? But it has less of an effect on the story because like in Liyue, when we fight this guy, it's like, oh, crud. It's one of Morax's old, old, old enemies that just got released by the Fatui. We know how powerful this thing is because it took a fucking god to kill it. It's a god in its own right. But in Yashiori Island, the, the snake, it's dead. We can't have that anymore. Unless something becomes a necromancer and just turns it, you know, brings it back to life, but I highly doubt that's gonna happen. Okay, I've been on this point a bit too long. I feel like, uh, in summary from the, of that last point, just use a bit more of the content outside of the game, into, weave it into the conversations, maybe like a few hints. The Tenryo Commission and Sara's impact on the war. This is addressing the point where Sara finds out that the Commission is working with the Fatui. Yet, we don't see the effects of it in the war that Sara is leading against the Resistance because she's a general. She's a general that is doubting her cause because of a recently uncovered plot of collusion. You could argue that Goro and Kazuha showing up at Tenshukaku right as we leave is the effect of it because, oh hey, the resistance just stormed the capital city. But we don't see any fighting. I mean, sure, we hear Paimon like, Oh, the guards are fighting something. But it would have been better if we saw the resistance and Sara having back and forth, just given more time to, you know, fight each other and have Sara, once she finds out, just slowly losing her edge until she's pushed back to the capital and then overtaken by the resistance enough so that. Goro and Kazuha and the rest of the, that squad gets to Tenchukaku in time to meet us and, you know, do the whole double vision thing. But, you know, like, fuck, it's a wasted plot thread. Um, the Fatui Harbingers, again, did not have enough screen time. We didn't see Scaramouche be as evil as he should have been. Because keep in mind, people without the shooting stars fans are beating him for the first time. He has to look evil. He has to look like an asshole. Same thing with Senora. We've seen her business in Mondstadt when she fucking punched the gnosis out of Venti. I know she just yanked it out of him, but you know, whatever. And we've seen how cunning she could be by tricking child. Tricking child and us into fighting a pointless war against that to buy herself time all for Zhongli's test. We've seen how cunning she could be. Yet here, here she is just reduced to, oh, the, what was the third commission? Kanryo? Kanryo. Commission head had a meeting with this bitchy lady and then she shows up and then she shows up like then she shows up 
at the Capitol in front of A and knocks Sarah out. She just kind of shows up there. I know she's overseeing the the delusion manufacture ma- the the manufacture. What's the word? She's making the delusions, but we don't see her do it. It's a case of telling and not showing, and we should have seen her working on it. Scaramouche's origins, you know. The guy with the gnosis? Yeah, he just... He's basically the Archon now. He has the gnosis. And he's a pup. He's a, essentially a clone of the Archon. So he's practically an Archon. Yet we don't see anything of him. We don't... The only thing of his origins we do have is the little bit... At the end with Yai Miko. That. And. What else do we have? Yeah, it's essentially just that, I think. But he needs more screen time to build up his power. You know? Especially after getting the exchange of the Gnosis. We should have seen him again. Should have noticed that he was more reserved more calm and more powerful the second time we meet him Yash- the yashiro and yoimiya are wasted in this second half granted the yashiro commission makes sense because if they openly join the resistance it's a revolt against the shogun but yoimiya is a res- like helping the resistance in at the start of Inazuma, by help helping rescue the guy that makes fake visions, so why doesn't she get to join in? Why doesn't she help? She is right in the city. That's where she lives. Okay, where else? Addressing first, Mister Shooting Star. Okay. Uh, other other points that are other other points that I have gathered that I wish were that I wish were in the story. I wish it addressed the people that missed the shooting stars event. I'm going over this again because it's in my notes and I keep remembering it and but not you know I've I've said it enough. The fact that Makoto died 500 years ago in the fall of Kanria. And the fact that, you know, A was there and saw those, like, cube things that looked like the thing from the opening cutscene where we were picking who our character was. Why not ask a bit more about that? Other, just, this is just the thing that I wanted, but A uses Makoto's sword whenever she, like, whenever, you know, she does the thingy, or, like, it, or she uses a very similar sword, I think. I think, but it was passed on to her. I wish she would go into, like, if, I wish we talked more about Makoto. I wish we did, and how she was so different from A, or like, how she was different from A. I wish there was like a comparison there. And I also wish it, to connect that, a series of losses of her friends, I wish that was gone into more depth, maybe in a story quest for A, I'm not sure. And the fight against the the snake thing, that should be another plot point that's addressed. It's probably going to be in Kokomi's story quest. As of the time of recording this video, Kokomi is not out yet, so we do not know. Oh, another thing. The time skip after we get appointed head of the Swordfish 2 squad. We could have been seeing other shit. Like, sure, 
time skip trade with the team that also didn't show up for the rest of the fucking Archon quest. But, you know, apparently you trained, trained with Swordfish 2 for a few days. We've seen... We've seen Mihoyo pull the camera away from the from the twin that we chose. We saw it once. We saw it once while Devalin is flying overhead. Remember the the thing where we realized, oh shit, our twin is working with the Abyss Order as Devalin flies overhead into Storm Terror's lair. Why not have another one like that? Why not? Why not have Scaramouche or Senora walk into a place? Why not show us Tepe fighting with the delusion, being a fucking badass, but not realizing that he's getting all wrinkly and old? We should have seen it. We should have seen it. It would have given us much, much more. Why am I going on this rant? Well, inspired by Aster and heeding to the statement that it's not for it to be um, for, I'm paraphrasing, but I believe that for it to be criticism, you should offer solutions. So I went through and looked at the Genshin Wiki for a few hours just to refresh myself. And I rearranged the story. Given I wish it had more time. So I made a version of the story that had more time. And I did set some rules for myself. Rule one, I'm not allowed to add or remove characters. If a character shows up and they play a major part, they're going to show up in one way or another. When they show up, that can be changed. I will try to be, I tried to be as original to the characters as possible. I'm not sure if I did it right, but I tried. This is mostly a rearranging of the events, putting some things before others and dropping hints. And one more thing. The Traveler has been shown to canonically be able to use all of the elements at their disposal at the same time. We've seen it during the fight cutscene with Child, when the, the first time we fight them. Why didn't they use that at all during any of the cutscenes? During the cutscene where we saved Toma, all they used was Electro to give them a speed boost. Why not, you know, make rock walls so that the, the Shogun Samurai couldn't get there? Why not blow them away with Animo? So I, in this rewrite, I'm gonna stick to the canon of Liyue, where they can use multiple elements at once. This is probably going to be an extremely, extremely long video that is going to be difficult as fuck to render out. Or a bunch of smaller videos. But, you know, we'll see in the future. So, with that out of the way, let me see. This is my rendition of the Genshin Impacts Chapter 2 Inazuma Story Arc Let's start off Let's start where we left off at Liyue Right after meeting our sibling Right after our second meeting with Dainsleaf and learning about Kanria
We stand there looking dejected for a bit. Though after some encouragement from Paimon, we decide to keep going and look for a lead to Inazuma. Our only lead so far is Atsuko in Liwe Harbor, who was an Inazuma native that managed to escape the storm and drift to Liwe Harbor. After talking to her, she tells us that Beidou and the crew of the Yalcor regularly go back and forth between Inazuma and Liwe. She also informs us that the Crux class, the Crux Clash, is currently underway. After heading to Guyon Stone Forest and inquiring about it, we participate and win, meeting Kazuha, another Inazuman, along the way. As a part of the crew, Kazuha joins us for the journey. And as our prize for winning the Crooks Clash, we are given a ride to Inazuma. In the downtime between that, Kazuha tells us about the Electro Archon that has been protecting Inazuma ever since the Archon War. He says offhandedly, now that the Geo Archon is dead, only the Raiden Shogun and Barbados of Mondstadt are left of the original Seven. Is this why she changed her mind and decided to pursue eternity? This strikes the traveler, this strikes our curiosity. Since Zhong Li has told us that the Electro Archon that was originally part of the Seven has passed away. It appears that the people of Inazuma do not know of this. This is the end of the prologue. Chapter 2, Act 1, The Immovable God and the Eternal Euthynia. A, a few days after the Crooks clash and our conversation with Kazuha, we meet up and board the Alcor as we sail toward Inazuma. A cutscene then plays, showing the Alcor braving the storm, cutting through the fog as it parts the beautiful uh, uh, wrong island to the beautiful Rito region of Narukami Island. Beidou accompanies us off the ship and introduces us to Toma. Though the Alcor stay has to be cut short, seeing as Kazuha is still a wanted fugitive. Because of this, we are left with Toma, who guides us around. A change that I have compared to what is normally there is having a few Shnezhnayan immigrants in Rito. Some are openly Fatui members, others are not. But you notice a uh, larger than normal density from the region of the Saritza. As Toma is showing us around, we pan out, seeing someone is watching us from an alley, leaving with the last frame of the cutscene being a shot of the corner of their large hat. Toma introduces us to Kurisu, a friend and head of the association that helps immigrants, that helps the 
foreigners get a hold, get a home in the Manzuma. Kursu is dealing with a problem. The Kanjo, oh that's what they're called, the Kanjo Commission has recently stopped accepting Mora as payment, only accepting a resource called Crystal Marrow. The association's supply has run out, and we are commissioned to investigate. During our investigation, we find a set of records that leave traces of Fatui involvement with the Kanjo Commission. We get into a verbal argument, but Toma saves us and explains to us his role with the Yashiro Commission. He also says to meet him at Komora Tea House in Inazuma City. However, this invitation was ultimately a test, seeing as we cannot leave Rito without a permit. A permit. Unable to leave and failing negotiations with the Kanjo head, Hiragi Shinsuke, we are called by his daughter to meet after dark. Hiragi Chisato informs us of a meeting her father had a few days prior to our arrival. She says, There were a few of them. One was a tall woman and another wore a very large hat. The tall woman seemed aware of your arrival, and she asked my father to keep you, to keep anyone that looked like you from leaving Rita. After that, she hands us two letters. The first is a love letter to Kamaji. The second son of the Tenryo Commission head. And the second letter is a word for word. A copy of what she had just told us. And ending the tell Kamaji about it as well. Ever since my father met with those people, he's been acting differently. When asked for more info, she would say that the meeting started over a year ago, right before the Vision Hunt Decree, and right before the Kanjo Commission stopped accepting Mora. We pose as her bodyguards and are let out of Rito. Arriving at the tea at the tea house, we are greeted by Toma. He gives us a tour around the city, which ends abruptly as we touch the statue of the omnipresent god. Flashes of memories. Memories of the people. From the people whose visions were taken. You see shogunate, breaking into homes, stopping people in the street, tearing apart families, with the final memory being that of the Uso no Hitotachi, as the Raiden shogun slowly draws her blade and takes steps toward whoever the previous holder of this vision was. After we come back to our senses, we explain the experience to Toma, who decides that the rest of the tour can be put on hold. He brings us to the Kamisato estate to meet with Ayaka. Ayaka asks us to help in abolishing the Vision Hunt Decree, to which we refuse. However, Ayaka has another commission for us, asking us to aid 
people that have lost their vision due to the decree. If we would not help directly, we could at least help with this. First is the man losing his memory in Konda village. After we help him remember that he's waiting for his lover, the conversation then goes into more detail on the travel restrictions going in and out of Inazuma. The second person is a samurai from the Tenryo Commission who lost his memories and is being threatened by citizens about withholding rations. After dealing with that, he th still threatens to use his sword on the citizenry, but can't pull through. As he mumbles about his morality, he offhandedly mentions the war with the resistance movement happening to the west of Narukami Island. The third, a swords master whose students believe him to be possessed. In assisting this, we are led to the Grand Narukami Shrine, and we are introduced to Yai Miko. Our interactions with Yai are brief. With her looking at crows that have perched on the rooftops, stating that she'll be keeping an eye on us, and that she has high expectations of us. We remind her of a certain friend, due to our stubbornness. After that, with everything all said and done, Paimon suggests that we meet up with Ayaka again. We ask about the resistance movement that we heard, and Ayaka goes into more depth, telling us about the fake visions that allow some resistance members to evade capture. However, things are not as bright as they appear, because Masakatsu, the man responsible for creating those fake visions, has recently been captured. Unable to help directly, because of her position in the Yashiro Commission, she tells us to meet with a person called Yoimiya, and together we would break him out. After meeting with Yoimiya and witnessing the fake visions being used, she tells us about how she almost lost her vision if it weren't for Master Masakatsu. With Yoimiya, Paimon, and us, we head to the station and break him out, encountering Akujo Sara along the way. She gives a scan along all four of us, noticing that Masakatsu is gravely injured. Thus she lets us go to give him aid, but threatens that she will get him back into his cell, one way or another. After Yoimiya and Master Masakatsu give thanks, we meet up with Ayaka and Toma again, and we have some downtime. Toma says that the Tenryo Commission has recently been tasked with preparing for a ceremony, which catches Ayaka's attention, since it is usually the Yashiro Commission in charge of any ceremonies in Inazuma. With her curiosity piqued and desiring more information, Ayaka leaves the room for a moment, though we follow her. We hear her whispering, and notice her silhouette bending down to meet with another silhouette of a person that is noticeably smaller than her. As that second person walks away, they leave quietly, and almost instantaneously. Nevertheless, they leave, and Ayaka returns and we play a hot pot game at the request of Toma. 
At this point, Ayaka and Story Ayaka and Yoimiya's story quests are played. And Act 2 is unlocked. Act 2. Stillness. The sublimation of shadow. The next day, we meet up at the tea house, only to learn that Toma has been taken and his vision is to be used as the hundredth vision in the statue. We rush toward it, arriving in time to rescue Toma. We use our geo powers to make physical barriers and use animal to blow away the guards that decide to come in close. And as the Raiden Shogun telekinetically crabs Toma's vision out of his belt thing, we use Electro to boost our speed and snatch it out of the air. However, in doing that, using multiple elements at the same time, all without a vision, we have piqued the curiosity of the Shogun, who draws her blade and sends us into her plane of Yusaimia. Putting up a great valiant fight, we are still no match for the Shogun, who knocks us down and intends to finish us off with the Muso no Hidotachi. As she prepares the technique, walking toward us with sword in hand, we recall the memory of that vision user that lost his life to this very attack. However, Soma manages to cut his binds enough and throws a spear at the Raiden Shogun, who deflects it and creates a shockwave that allows us to escape. She orders a warrant for our arrest and threatens that she will strike twice. Taking refuge at Komoriti House, Toma suggests that we leave the city and find the resistance. With no other option, we say our goodbyes and head west. On our way there, we follow leads of people that are escaping both sides, trying to avoid trouble. We follow this trail until we find a resistant soldier fighting off Shogunate Samurai though he's about to lose. Coming to his rescue and assisting him, he introduces himself as Tepe and takes us to the resistance camp. At the camp, we are introduced to Goro, the general of the resistance, the, before Tepe offers to show us around. We tend to wounds, we train soldiers, and just as we lower the arrow that we used to train the soldiers with, the shogunate arrives at the camp with a surprise attack. We defend it with Tepe, and as we walk around, he laments, thinking that this place was so fortified, but the shogun and the shogun's army just managed to sneak up on them. It would have been impossible for them to arrive undetected. After finding the broken wall, we have a contest to see who could repair it faster. And in that time, he mumbles about how they could either have outside assistance or if there was a traitor in the resistance. Both are bad options. I don't know which one I want more, he jokes offhandedly, as he orders some people to strengthen their patrols, complaining about having to do some logistics work again, after only recently being able to go on the front lines to prove himself. With the repairs done, 
we decide to meet up with Goro to inform him of the situation. However, we find that he's not there, currently in a skirmish with Kujo Sara. Tepe, eager to prove himself again, insists that we join the fray. We arrive seeing both armies face off, staring each other down. Sara offers Goro a deal, a temporary ceasefire, in return for handing us over to the shogunate. Goro refuses just as we arrive. Sara then turns her attention toward us, offering us something, a fight of honor. It was no contest and we won easily, but that victory is short-lived as Sara orders her army to charge. Both armies collide with each other, though the shogun, the shogunate soldiers are far too powerful for the resistance. Just as they are on the brink of defeat, bubbles signify Kokomi's arrival, along with a few mercenaries that she managed to recruit. Familiar faces, as Beido and Kazuha, decimate the shogunate army, forcing Sara to retreat. After the battle, we tell of our travel so far to Beido and Kazuha, who then link the rumors about the event in the city to us. I always knew you were something, kid. So at the moment, but I can't keep missing these incredible fights you get into. Beido jokes. The Komi wishes to talk with us. However, this is not the location. Telling us to rendezvous with her at the Sangonomiya Shrine on Watatsumi Island. Tepe offers to be our guide. After that, Kokomi discusses with Goro about having the mercenary station nearby to deter any further attacks from the shogunate. She also informs him of an incoming shipment of supplies from a new sponsor. And of Act 2. The story so far was all 2.0. This is the beginning of 2.1 story, and thus more changes are about to happen. So, bear with me for Act 3, Omnipresence over Mortals. A few days pass, and our meeting with Kokomi is drawing closer. Tepe calls us over for the journey over to Watatsumi Island, and on our way he tells us of some rumors he's heard around the camp. They saw General Goro taking a few of us out to test, the, test out the new weapons we got from our sponsor. They say it gives us comparable strength to a vision user. He says as we arrive at the shrine and meet up with Kokomi, who was talking to another person about managing supplies for an expansion in the army. Tepe asks about the expansion and Kokomi tells us directly about this new sponsor. Although she is suspicious of their motives, Men and weaponry are not something to be refused in a war. Tepe gives us a glance and a smile after confirming that the rumors were true. We are then appointed head of Swordfish 2, one of the top squads in the resistance, and are given a letter to show our stature despite being a new recruit. After meeting the team and proving ourselves, we return and get word of our first assignment hearing that Tepe is in a naval battle off-handedly from Kokomi. We are to investigate Fort Mume for missing supplies. Beido and the Yalcor will be assisting in this mission, due to the fact that the fort is partially submerged. While preparing with the squad to rendezvous with Beido, training and practicing our swordplay, Tepe swings by and tells us he's been promoted because of the naval battle, now heading his own squad, Herring 1. He tells, it, he tells us that he's excited about their new uniforms. Shortly after that, a member from his squad calls him away and we spend the next few days continuing our preparations. Beido and the crew of the Alcor meet us as we head over to Fort Mune. 
armed for combat, just in case. We learn that, in addition to Swordfish 2 and the crew of the Alcor, Herring 1 is also on this mission. However, we notice that Kazuha is missing from any and all roll calls. Beidou tells us that he is doing an independent investigation about some suspicious activity he noticed along the shores of Yashiori Island. Fatsui. There are a bunch of them. She says as they arrive. As we walk through Fort Mume, a crow flies overhead, landing nearby while carrying a single sakura petal. As we investigate and activate a th elect an electro mechanism, a Thunderhelm Lava Churl, as well as a few other Hillichurls ambush us. We fight it, getting interrupted by a cutscene once it reaches 50% HP. The cutscene shows us shows us the skirmish. We, Beidou, and Tepe take on the Lava Churl, as the rest of our squads take on the smaller Hill Churls. As we fight, Tepe pulls out a vision. Tell Tepe pulls out the weapon that the sponsors have given us. A delusion. After the fight, we take him aside and explain what delusions are to him. Knowing full well that they're made by the Fatsui. However, that is all we know at this moment. We also notice that his hair is starting to change in color. And we tell him about this. Despite knowing... Despite knowing that it came from the Fatui, and our warnings, he is still hesitant to give it up, willing to give his, willing to give his life for any advantage in a fight. However, he does agree that we should inform Kokomi. As we return to Watatsumi Island, we see that Kazuha and Goro are already in talks with Kokomi. The topic is that of the delusions and the Fatui. Goro notices that the troops are aging faster because of them, and Kakomi suggests cutting ties. Kazuha says that he's found the location of a nearby factory, the creation place of these delusions. Tepe chimes in, thinking of following the Fatui to see if, they're, if they have anything else planned or if they have any other factory stationed in Inazuma. But Kokomi refuses and shoots down the idea, stating that, because of the war with the Shogunate, they don't have anyone to spare, and they've already lost so much due to the aging of the troops and the loss of this new weapon. Unable to spare anyone for backup. We leave, in the middle of the night, and attack the factory alone. As we make a mess of the place, we see crate after crate of crystal marrow. As we reach the end, we meet with two harbingers. One familiar, and one less so. Signora... And the small person with the hat introduces himself as Scaramouche. After a conversation, mostly of insults and threats, Signora fights us while Scaramouche just watches, walking back and forth. Signora sends Ice Blast our way, and the fight is even for the most part. However, Scaramouche is growing irritated with every second that pass. So he pulls the lever and releases a gas that infuses the air with Tataragami energy. Signora stops for a moment to scowl at him, 
for turning her attention back to us and getting an advantage in the fight due to the power-up of the Tataragami. However, right before she can finish us off, a gust of wind blows the gas away as Kazuha, who had been following us and sneaking around the factory that he discovered, comes in to help us escape, telling us that Komi noticed that we were missing. As we run outside of the factory, he brings us to the Alcor, with Beta waiting for us. The three of us talk. The four of us talk. Beidou suggests tracking the Harbingers. However, Kazuha chimes in that and states that remaining undetected would be difficult, especially since there's a warrant for all of their arrests due to their affiliation with the Resistance. However, he does concede that the information of the Fatui activity is desperately needed. Paimon then interrupts, remembering the short person that Ayaka talked to during our last visit to the tea house. Noticing that they'd be extremely quiet and difficult to detect, Beidou suggests that we go find them. However, the Alcor is unable to make the journey with us, saying as a large ship would be attacked instantly compared to a few people that can blend into a crowd. We are to meet with Ayaka alone, and we do so. We meet them at the Kamisato estate this time. where Toma suggests setting up a hot pot game once again. We tell them about what happened with the resistance, and that we're looking for that person that Ayaka talked to. Ayaka reveals her name as Sayu. Sayu, yes, she would be great at following them. After she returned from her previous assignment, nobody has seen her. She is a little too good at hiding. She usually likes to nap around Grand Narukami Shrine, so I would suggest that you begin your search there. We head to the shrine, meeting with the Aimiko again, who has been expecting us. She tells us that we've sur surpassed her expectations, and that, again, we remind her of a certain friend from long, long ago. Inquiring further, and asking why the people of Inazuma still think that the current Electro Archon is the original Electro Archon, she tells us about her old friend, the Raiden Shogun herself. The Electro Archon today has changed since last we met, losing friend as Guy walks around, a crow lands nearby after friend she passes by the shrine noticing a few children wearing masks running around after friend here she stops placing a hand at the sacred sakura tree who you notice the shape which you notice is shaped like a fox head but losing her it's the final straw. The original Electro Archon passed away 500 years ago. And her sister, her twin sister, had to take over. Nobody in Inazuma ever knew. Previous Electro Archon loved transients, choosing to live in the present moment. However, since her passing, 
since all of the loss that the current Electro Archon has endured. He has feared transience, feared loss. So much so that she asked me to help her put her consciousness into objects so that she could meditate forever for the rest of eternity. To fill her spot as she meditated, she left me some important things. She created puppets to act as her surrogate. I believe you've come across one of the early prototypes of a puppet that currently serves as the Raiden Shogun. That prototype is the Baladir, the Fatui. And it was much stronger than the one that currently acts as the Raiden Shogun. So much so that A had to put limiters on it before she left it to wander. Honestly, this... She's acting like a child, unable to clean up her mess. After some more explaining, she tells us where Sayu is. And, after finding her, we and Sayu make plans to follow the two Harbingers around Inazuma. Cue obligatory stealth mission that happens in every chapter of the story. We tail the Harbingers to the HQ of the Tenryo Commission, and discover the head of the commission working with him, with both of them. Much like the Kanjo Commission before, supplied them with the crystal marrow that they needed to create delusions. The Tenryo Commission is enacting the Vision Hunt Decree because of the Fatui. Signora reads a false report that the Tenryo Commission plans to give to the Shogun, saying that the Vision Hunt Decree is going without any opposition and that the citizenry are willing willingly giving up their visions to be placed into the statue. As we are about to escape to relay the information back to the Resistance and back to the Yashiro Commission, we are spotted. And we are forced to fight once again. This is where the true fight with Zinmara is. We buy time to let Sayu escape. And after managing to defeat Signora, even with her unleashing her true identity as the Crimson Witch, we stand victorious. And before we are able to finish her off and continue the, the fight with Scaramouche, the door bursts open as Kujo Sara storms in, getting notified of a struggle by all of the noise and accompanied by more shogunate soldiers. Using this moment of us being distracted, Scaramouche sends an attack our way, with Signora taking collateral damage and dying at our feet. The attack was so powerful that it sent everyone else in the room to their knees or knocked them unconscious. With us being left on all fours, panting heavily. As he readies another attack to finish us off, footsteps are heard as Yaimiko slowly walks inside. She jokes that we shouldn't talk with Sayu so loudly, saying as she heard it all the way from the shrine. Turning her attention to Scaramouche, she makes a deal. Our life for the Electronosis, to which he agrees and leaves. We never hear from Scaramouche again for the rest of our time in Inazuma. And with Senyara dead, all that's left is the Raiden Shogun. Yai takes us back to the Grand Narakami Shrine to tend to our wounds. Zara returned to the front lines. However, after seeing that the Fatsui were in negotiations with the head of the Tenryo Commission, 
Her strategic calls have been shoddy, and the resistance have been gaining ground. Set to arrive at the capital within a few days. Sayu appears during one of the days with a letter from Ayaka, who is already penning a letter to expose the collusion of the other two commissions. This letter also informs us that the large resistance force has just landed on the Narukami mainland, and she suspects that an attack will happen soon. Yai gives us a pouch and tells us to keep, tells us to keep it close to her, to us. Taking that as our cue to prepare, we head down and see that the resistance is marching toward Inazuma City, with Sarah and her army stationed just before to defend. We arrive, seeing Kazuha, Beido, Goro, and Tepe, who is noticeably old, older, but still capable of fighting, all awaiting orders from Kokomi, who's on the field, staring Sarah down. Sara scans the resistance, locking eyes with us as she raises her hand. You were there. I saw you. What are you going to do? We say that we're going to tell the Shogun everything? She, she, she says to prove it to her, and the fight begins as both armies charge at each other. Tokomi tells us something before we go ahead. We'll be right behind you. Getting past the chaos, we race toward Tenshukaku, cutting down the guards that get in our way. True to their word, the resistance is following behind us, though they are stalled by the guards and the soldiers in the city. As we see Tenshukaku, Tenshukaku approaching, and we get close to the statue of the omnipresent god, a bolt of lightning strikes down at the road ahead of us. Waiting for us, standing by the statue, is the Raiden Shogun, who calls us toward her. We converse and we fight, trying to demolish the ideals of eternity that she so, so fervently holds on to. But we are still no match for the Muso no Hito touch. However, just as the resistance, just as the attack is about to be performed, the resistance arrives, with Kokomi and Tepe being in front, while the rest are holding off guards that arrive and attack them from the side. As the sword bears down on us, Tepe, once again, pulls out the delusion from his pocket and uses it to increase the speed enough to intercept the attack, reducing the damage that we take, but fatally wounding him as we are brought back down to our knees. Kazuha, seeing this happen, remembers the words of his friend and activates the electrovision that he got from his dying body. Empowered with the strength of both visions, he charges at the Raiden Shogun, buying the resistance time to tend to our wounds and get Tepe out. Kazuha is good, but he's still no match alone. So Kokomi orders us to attack, orders the resistance to attack. But during that time, the Shogun is already about to use the Munso no Hitotachi for a fourth time, for, for a third time. After seeing it used four times, with the first being the memory of that vision holder, we know that it would be hopeless for the resistance to attack now. It would be a slaughter. So we charge ahead, with our sword in hand, 
we force the Shogun to bring us into the plain of Euthymia. There we confront A, telling her of the struggles of her people, but she fails to see the, to see the impact. Then we fight her, and as we're about to lose, we feel a surge of power coming from the visions embedded in the statue that are slowly getting reactivated because of the will of the resistance soldiers. We tell A that living in stasis would only make Inazuma crumble, and the voice agrees with us as Yae Miko appears, having manifested herself thanks to the pouch that she gave you, gave us. After conversing once more, and fighting, A finally concedes, and says that she's going to think about the vol abolishing the Vision Hunt Decree. Until then, a ceasefire will be called. With that compromise, A says that she'd like some time alone to reflect on everything as we are given an act, act into Inazuma proper. A few days pass. The temporary ceasefire has been agreed upon by both sides. The resistance accepting the ceasefire because of their fear of the Muso no Hitotachi. Yaimiko calls us to the Grand Norokami Shrine, which is oddly abandoned and tranquil as we arrive. She greets us, telling us to move quietly as we turn the corner and see A solemnly praying at the sacred sakura tree. After we're spotted, we do the usual talk to the archon with text options after each chapter. The questions are about my sibling, where do we go next? about the Vision Hunt Decree, and about the future of Inazuma. The first two dialogue options remain the same. About the Vision Hunt Decree, has A still thinking about what to do? She expresses thanks to us for bringing her the information, but says that she needs to see for herself what has happened to Inazuma. Yai chimes in occasionally to tease her. About the future of Inazuma, has Yai and A reminiscing about Makoto's original desire for Inazuma, transience. Yai offer, offers to show her how much Inazuma has changed since she started meditating to keep to help her make her choice. And thus, Chapter Two of Genshin Impact Story comes to a close. I have not written it down. But I would also change Raiden Shogun's story quest. Have her go around to see how the commissions have impacted Inazuma. The struggling foreigners that live on Rito Island. The effect of losing one's vision has on the people. The amount of death that the war has started. Coming to terms with this, she finally agrees to abolish the decree at the end of her story quest. And we give a suggestion that she tell Inazuma the truth about Makoto and her. That is that plot point is not answered in this story quest. If I were to decide how to continue that story quest, it would be with one of A's old friends, the Oni that was killed. Or that was corrupted and wounded by a trio. This would be the second weekly boss in Inazuma if I had my way. And we start off with a story quest part two. After abolishing the Vision Hunt decree, A has decided to make a few rounds of current Inazuma 
to see what has changed and ask us to accompany her. During our travels, we hear of a rumor of an of a demon that is attacking a certain town. With her curiosity piqued and the safety of her people in danger, A decides to confront it. During this time, she tells us no. During this time, we pass by multiple sakura trees that remind A of Kitsune Saigu. It is at this point that she tells us of her friends, Sasayuri the Tengu, who died during the fight with Orobashi. Shio, an oni who was corrupted long ago, who A had to fight and ran away. Hitsune Saigu, who, as we know, had fought a corruption that had consumed her, and finally, of Makoto, her sister that died during the fall of Conria 500 years ago. And after this story and a few more looking for clues, we eventually find a cave hidden, hidden in a mountain. I'm not sure which one yet, but we find it. And A instantly recognizes the face of Chio. Far too corrupted to ever be called her friend again. This is the fight that becomes the second weekly boss of Inazuma. As A finally puts Chio to rest. The story quest ends with a small grave and a dendrobium flower being placed by A. She asks for a bit of time to mourn and we give it to her. The grave will also serve as the trigger to start the boss fight. That is how I would do Inazuma. I am not the best, and this is the first draft of this, because I have written this in one night. Or, I've written the main story in one night. The story quest of A, I thought of on the spot. But, this is my interpretation. Make of that what you will. Thank you for listening. I seriously hope that future me remembers to link the video from Aster in the description because it is the inspiration for this entire thing. Thank you very much. Shoot out.